Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Lawrence. Um, may I take maybe five or six minutes to quickly go through some of the uh, background information about, say, the trend of IoT, IOB, and then the autonomous. Because in the morning, well, we've enjoyed um, many very good uh, presentations about the application of IoT and also the web services. But of course, because my expertise are um, more focus on the automotive engineering. So may I share some of my uh, experience about the application of IoT and also the connected technology uh, in the automotive industry. Uh, first of all, let's just quickly go through. Uh, whenever we talk about IoT, you know, things, well, maybe from my word, uh, I, uh, what I would like to emphasize, it should be everything, right? Internet of everything. Just like our smartwatch or even a smart earphone, um, smartphone, of course, we have a lot. Uh, the smart home, or even, uh, well, in the morning, we noticed that um, even some of the very traditional uh, home appliances, just like toaster, uh, we tried our best to connect them to the internet. Yep. But of course, we need all those um, applications successfully implement uh, the key enablers. Are including, of course, connectivity, that means all the wireless uh, 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 communication, and also the sensors, right? On top of that, we need the software, the control software, just like the API, application program interface, just like the apps, and also cloud storage. The most important thing is uh, data, very big data, but whenever we talk about the big data, it's not only focused on the quantity, but uh, it's a type of data. Okay, the data source, we need a multi uh, multiple sources of data. And in this, just like a supply chain, right? because if you trade the IoT as a new business, maybe uh, we need all of them and you can be part of them. You can be the supplier of all those enablers. Now, in the automotive industry, uh, we have different terminologies just like V2V, vehicle to vehicle communication, and also vehicle to grid. The grid stands for power grid. Okay, the power system, and also vehicle to home, V2H, and vehicle to anything, the infrastructure, just like maybe the communication between the vehicle to the building, communication between vehicle to the um, road infrastructure, the street lamp, et cetera, et cetera. But normally we just use a generic term IOV covering all those things. Um, in the past, you know, almost 20 years ago, uh, starting from 1995 uh, in America, uh, the General Motors, they launched a new program called um, OnStar. Uh, they are the first uh, company try to build in the, the modem, okay? Just like a 2G communication uh, hardware and module, they put it on board, try to send all the data from the uh, OBD, the onboard diagnosis uh, stuff, and then back to the server to, to do the, uh, not the, not the big data analysis, but just for navigation, for safety, security, and also the very limited level of maintenance services. Uh, but nowadays, of course, just like Tesla and some other um, uh, very uh, new uh, or ambitious uh, uh, car makers, OEM, they tried to make use of this kind of quantitivity uh, to develop their new vehicle model, okay? Uh, of course, right now, the features is not only limited to the navigation and also safety security, but the um, autonomous driving. So today we're here. Uh, in the future, we expect that by 2020, by 2020, according to this figure, yes, um, the autonomous driving uh, should be uh, well more promising in terms of technology, of course. Well, uh, very uh, important figures right here. Uh, according to the um, market research, uh, in mainland China by 2020, over 90% of the cars, now not only restricted to the electric vehicle, but say the plug-in high uh, plug-in electric vehicle, uh, gasoline engine vehicle or diesel engine vehicle or the traditional vehicles, uh, over 90% of them will be connected to the internet. Now, they will generate the very, very big revenue. Uh, it's over 250 million, uh, billion RMB. Um, in 2020, that will be the big market. Well, uh, IOV, internal vehicle, is more than big data, of course. Now, but how to capture, how to collect all those data? Uh, yes, the, 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 the Amazon, uh, Amazon Web Service, 
uh, the speaker introduced a lot, say how to uh, analyze those data, but uh, our interest is more focused on how to collect data. In fact, in automotive industry, we uh, make use of a, a very small stuff, the very small electronics devices that is called the OPD, Onboard Diagnosis Tools. It's a standardized product, okay? It's a commonly used protocol. Uh, well, in recent 15 years, uh, 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 new car models, they, they're all equipped with the uh, same uh, OBD connectors. That means we can simply uh, produce this kind of OBD data collection, co collecting devices, and then by using uh, 3G, 4G, or even 5G to connect those collected data to the uh, server, then we can get things done. Well, RV creates new ecosystem. Right here, I want to emphasize this. Uh, well, uh, big use of the big data collected from the automotive industry, collected from the vehicles. We can facilitate fit management, safety, security, uh, well, even fuel, fuel economy, traffic information, insurance. Well, how can we can uh, also benefit the insurance industry? Because, uh, of course, the, the say the, the, the banker or the insurance service provider, if they understand that, oh, uh, you are the uh, good driver, <laughs> Uh, uh, however, if uh, uh, unluckily, if you you are not a good driver, maybe uh, uh, they will uh, increase the, the the premium price for your uh, insurance package in the coming year. <laughs> All right. Now, uh, as what I mentioned in twenty years ago, uh, OnStar they are the first service provider in the automotive industry to provide these kind of IOV services. Uh, but in the past, it's a kind of nice to have system. But today, uh, there's a mandatory requirement uh, uh, launched by uh, uh, the EU in last year. Now, the, the new requirement, uh, they call it as an e-call, emergency call, okay? Now again, uh, make use of the small modem devices, uh, put it on your vehicle. Now, um, by the end of uh, first quarter 2018, that means next, next year after April 1st, all the new car, uh, produced uh, in European countries, they have to equip with this kind of e-call system, All right? In the future, that, that, that will be the must-have requirement. I uh, try to skip this one. Oh, uh, last, the last page right here. Now, whenever we talk about IOV, well, the ultimate goal of the IOV is to achieve autonomous driving. Now, for the autonomous driving, normally we have five different levels, of course, except the seal level. Seal level, that means um, uh, uh, all controlled by manual, no automation. And the so-called level one, the very typical one, just like the uh, parking assist camera or even the, um, uh, the active cursor control, the, all those are being classified as the driver assistance system. Now, normally we call it as a level one or two. But of course, if your vehicle can be con controlled purely by the computer. You don't need to board it. You, you can, you can uh, fail the slip even on board, then it's fine. Then that vehicle can be considered as a autonomous. All right, try to skip. Oh, the really last pages. IOV is coming. Arrived silently, actually. I already voted it. Because uh, if you are, I don't want to use the, the word oh, but if you are mature enough, I'm pretty sure you 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 should have uh, the experience for you for the for the use of Nokia phone, right? Uh, but of course, in a few years ago, uh, the CEO uh, said that we didn't do anything wrong, but somehow we lost because they cannot catch up the wave of the technology changes. So um, it's your decision. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks to this uh, Federation Hong Kong Industries and this uh, Hong Kong Electronic Industry Council for giving us this opportunity to introduce the new faces of security. My name is Alan Chua. I'm the Executive Director of Concord Security, uh, IoT enabled business model transform company. I mean, obviously today we talk about IoT, so I think I have to add in, I have to use up some, somehow rather use the IoT in my, in my speech. So who are and what are the new faces of security? And why do we call ourselves the new face of security? I hope that by the end of this short presentation, I can provide you the answer. 
Moving further, I must say that I'm quite happy to be back here in Hong Kong Science Park. Actually, this picture shows that we are here in 2015. In fact, uh, Henry Lau, the project chairman of this HKEIC, is part of New Pacers journey. We are with him, I think, in 2015 September. So in 2015 September, we are invited by this uh, Hong Kong Science Park to showcase, to introduce our IoT-enabled inventive business model, which we call I IMAN Facility Sprinter Solution, or IFS in short. This solution utilizes the latest state-of-the-art technology. It, get, it helps us to deliver high-level security guarding protection services by connecting multiple buildings together using data technology and the use of TV white space. What is so valuable and unique about our solution? Let me go to the next slide and show you how, what it is all about. Okay, imagine this Hong Kong Science Park. And looking at the slide, you can see that we cluster by connecting 10 buildings together. So when you do this, it's, we, the, whole, the whole place actually become a bigger building premises with smaller building with, with a number of smaller buildings. So when you do that, actually, what you can achieve is we replace, we replace the 10 set of individual security and facility officers in the building with another group of so-called delegated specialized security and facility officer. So what does that mean? It's very straightforward. I mean, the building owner, the asset owner, save at least 90% of the cost because 10 set is gone and one set is put in. Obviously, with the, the additional set of special, with the new set of specialized security and facility officer, I mean they were going to get and they are going they are going to be rewarded differently. So in this way, in this way by doing that, I mean this, uh, you can see from the uh, screen it's quite clear cut that instead of having those traditional, traditional so called uh, low low sort of uh, low skill level security officer on the ground, so we are providing a high tech specialist officer. So with this, with this, with this method connecting and then using latest technology and planting latest security equipment at certain strategic location, the premise, the whole premise, actually enjoy a higher level of security guarding services as well as better service level performance. So I think that is the benefit of so-called using IoT. It's actually this this model actually led us to achieve a quantum leap in terms of productivity gain and cost saving. And by definition, according to many professors and many established institutions, we are consider a, we are having a business model which is considered very disruptive. And with this disruptive model innovation, we aim to dominate the industry one day. And obviously, I mean, with this model, it's very easy for us to attract younger, more qualified people to work in this uh, technology shaped environment and in a state of the art mobile control cabin. So I think that, that link, link us to the why are we here today because as you can see, I mean security guard services is no longer just security guard services because it connected everything together by, what, by the IoT and in this way, we are able, we are able to, I mean you can see that, it, I mean if the IS platform is actually become the so-called IoT platform, IoT platform and it's a platform to introduce many technology and connect many technology. So we are, we are connecting so-called internet of many things. Not exactly everything, but internet many things. So smart city and smart building require smart response. This is what I has pro this is what I solution can provide the smart response. While we are basically concentrating on security, obviously, I mean a lot of FM solution provider, those speakers in the market, realize that we are also able to deliver FM solution. And in this area, that's why we are able, we are coming into the area of FM in the sense that we help firstly to monitor temperature, water level, aircon, lighting, and even for healthcare, we provide a connectivity for the home for the elderly who are living alone so that we can respond to any, any that eat immediately, to any other needs immediately in a very smarter way. As you can see, we are basically we, we, we create a solution, we create a business model solution, and we have uh, got two patents granted to us, and, and the third patent is patent pending. So what, that's, what is also special about this? In fact, this is, this, this, what we have what we're doing right now actually put us in a way, in a way to achieve so-called our vision of providing a smart security and connectivity for smart cities. 
you can see also we won. I mean, if any any of the audience from Singapore, you can see that basically we won all the IT or, or most of the IT in Singapore in the last two years. And the highest uh, recognition is just December last year. We are given the we are the winner of the National Infocom Award. And obviously, I mean, we, because of what we are doing, there's a lot of agency which now supporting us in Singapore. So how we fare in the last two years? We started this journey two years ago, and um, we can see from here, all the big name customer is with us at the present moment. And every month, we tend to have starting new contract for, 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 for new building owner. So at the rate we are going, we can easily establish another 500 so-called locations in Singapore. And at the rate we are moving, we are, we are, we are going to have 50 vehicle, 50 IS vehicle on the road. And that will again create a, a very high value in the sense that we create a mesh network of excellent cost connectivity. Obviously, I think the Singapore is not really a big market. So what we intend to do is the next part of the journey, we have to introduce this solution to the rest of the world. We have taken the first step of setting our office in London at the beginning of this year. And uh, with that, it's a base for us to enter Europe. And we are intending to go into the USA market next year. Of course, being a Singapore company, we are quite fortunate because our government supports a lot. And uh, why are we able to penetrate our so-called patent of solution in so many countries? Don't all together about 57 countries in less than two years is because we receive a lot of funding from IE Singapore. And of course, having been said that I'm here before previously 18 months ago, I think I also wanted to, to sort of offer this solution to Hong Kong. Hopefully it can commercialize in one day. And the best place supposed to start should be Hong Kong Science Park. And thank you very much. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm glad to have this opportunity to share about what is set wave technology and about my view of the market st uh, status. And thank you for Chris' introduction. So I cut to the subject directly now. Uh, let me uh, share an interesting history before I really tap into the set wave technology. Is there anybody we call a com computer called named Cray? Cray one? No, no one does. Oh, you 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 do. <clears throat> Cray one was a remarkable invention in the mid of seventies. It was considered the pinnacle of human technology uh, innovation of the computer science, and. It, the name Cray has been a synonymous for supercomputing for almost two decades. So let's take a look how impressive it, of this computer. It was running at 64 bit at 80 megahertz, 8 megabyte of RAM, and it consumes 115K watt power per hour. And actually, it needs 40 tons of the Freon. That's kind of the coolant of the air conditioner to cool it, to prevent it, to setting the fire for itself and room. And the price for this machine is cost 7.9 million in 1975. And this was a huge money. You can buy a street maybe in San Francisco because I checked the history a house in United States in California was sold for about twenty to some uh, thirty thousand U.S. dollar at that time. And after that, we have a lot of more interesting innovation and technological advancement. I think you guys all remember them, but. Do you still remember Netscape or US robotics thing? They have been emerged and gradually, subtly changed the way of our living and life. And with all these innovations getting penetrated together, and they collectively, and I think in 
inevitably facilitate the emerge of the IoT. So I don't need to explain what is IoT. This gentleman did. And back to the supercomputer. And at this moment, thanks to the super advancement of the semiconductor technology, we could have an equivalent supercomputer for the price of one or two dollars. And it can run on a battery. And now it's no longer called a supercomputer, but MCU. And it is ubiquitous in everywhere in our life, in all the gadgets and appliances. So this is amazing in what, uh, technological advancement in our life. So it enables everything we want to do in the IoT. OK, so. And actually, nowadays we have a lot of technologies for ready for IoT. Some are very popular and known to everybody, some are not. So I always got a question, what is set wave? Is, what is the difference between set wave and others such as SIGB? So my answer was in every single aspect. But unfortunately, actually set wave was not very well known in Hong Kong or in Asia. So I think this is a very good time I can share what is the difference between them. Uh, number one, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, two most of popular technology, and also Zigbee, they have something in common. The first thing in common is they are the technology specified by an organization called IEEE. And on the other hand, Z-Wave is a technology in within the system of the, we call the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union. And second, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and Zigbee, they share the same ISM band, which is the 2.4 gigahertz. And Z-Wave is not, is using a sub gigahertz uh, frequency. So what is IEEE? IEEE is the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. It is the world's largest and also the most influential organization made of some 400 members. They are all professionals in the WE or related subjects. So, uh, but actually this organization is a, com is a non government organization and I ITU is on the other hand based in Geneva Switzerland is actually a member of the United Nations development group its membership is actually states they have 193 member states and around 700 public and uh, in private sectors, companies. ITU coordinates the shared global use of the radio spectrum promotion, promotes international cooperation in assigning the satellite orbits and works to improve the telecommunication infrastructure in the developing world. So this is one of the difference from the rest and ITU also organized the spectrum used in the uh, 3G and 4G communication. Uh, I saw the, um, some pop popular te RF technologies, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, and C-Wave or Z-Wave. They all considered interoperable and compatible technology. But however, there are different kind of the interoperability. For example, Wi-Fi is most popular technology used in almost every computer and gadgets. Uh, take an example, Samsung, they have a 
fridge with Wi-Fi, and maybe you know, my dear, they also does. But these two appliances, they share the same Wi-Fi communication, they don't work together because they don't have uh, application level compliance or compatibility. So it's on, only on the physical and data link layer com compatibility. And Bluetooth is actually defined some application protocol compatibility, but they are mainly focused on multimedia and personal applications. It's not designed for IoT, and there is not yet any popular or interoperable protocol based on Bluetooth for this application. And ZigBee doing something further, they defined the network layers. So all the ZigBee devices, if they are compatible to the ZigBee Pro network, uh, network mass network protocol, they can claim themselves ZigBee com compatible devices. But again, there comes some actually a opposite problem with the rest. ZigBee Alliance, they defined more than seven so-called official profile for the interoperability of the application. And it creates further confusion of the application because they each, they each of them are not interoperable. Until recently, they released the ZigBee 3.0. They want to unify all this incompatible profile to make a truly unified profile, but it was failed. And if you look into the set wave, it has a very stringent conformity required for the, the application adopter. They has to be complying from the communication physical level up to the application level, or it's not permitted to be sold in the market. So this is the major difference between set wave and the rest. We are also facing another challenge for the RF-based IoT application, which is the signal collision. Due to the high penetration of the Wi-Fi deployment, we have overcrowded signal from Wi-Fi routers. And as Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and ZigBee, they share the same, same spectrum, so here comes a challenge for this kind of application, how could they provide a robust and reliable service over the time? So this is, I, from all I've seen in the progress, there's no satisfactory solution. Uh, as Wi-Fi has a very strong signal permitted, it's up to 100 milliwatt, and for the IoT application, normally we will not uh, allow more than 25 milliwatt in uh, application level on practical use is even less than 10 milliwatt. So you can imagine in such an environment, it's almost impossible to deploy ZigBee or wi a Bluetooth based IoT application in a robust manner. This is a challenge. Here an example. In 2012, Shenzhen Metro Route 2 and Route 5 start service. And in the first week of operation, they have frequent interruption for unknown reason. And finally, it was figured due to the, the popular use of the so-called Wi-Fi hotspot by the passengers they somehow interfere the, the security system of the car. It, it will trigger the, the car inside. They trigger the anti-braking system. So it interrupts the operation. So this is an, another real-world example 
for the challenge of using the overcrowd 214 gigahertz. So C-Wave take an, another approach to avoid this problem. They don't use 2.4 gigahertz. We use the sub gigahertz frequency. It depends on the country and regulation. The frequency is a slightly different, but mainly into three categories. Set wave is not a new technology. It has been developed and de uh, debuted in years 2000. So today is, is 17 years birthday already. And set wave for the application need and the series of the serious concern of the security, C wave also uh, encrypt a robust security measure to avoid security breach and sabotage. C wave employed the AES 128 encryption system and recently Recent means since last year, we upgrade our security mechanism to so-called S2 mechanism. It further closed the, the, the exposure of the key inter-exchange risk. We employed a so-called DV Hellman key inter-exchange method to make it bulletproof. Hence, C-Wave technology is by far the first mass network RF technology list in the UL component list, which means devices made of the Z-Wave technology are eligible to apply for UL certification. Of course, you need to also satisfy some other criteria of the certificate requirements in order to get a UL certification, but it opened a path for telco and security service provider industry to deploy set wave and it will be backed by insurance industries in United States. United States. This is a big milestone and, and achievement for an RF mass network technology so far. So it sets a big milestone for these two industry to further increase the variety of products they can de deliver to the customer and a very, very significant cost they can save. Due to the time limit for today, I am not going to elaborate every single technology or advancement of the set wave technology. If any of you have interest to dig deeper about set wave technology, I bought a book today. So if you want to take a look, you can grab it outside the set wave alliance booth. So I'm going to skip this because it will tend to time consuming. Uh, let me talk about the business-related subjects. As you guys know, Apple HomeKit is one of the potential technology or application model or business model for the smart home. And SetWave officially, they also announced the bridge code for SetWave gateway to work for Apple HomeKit system. The merit of using set wave technology are obvious. Number one, set wave technology, you don't need to buy the MFI chip. If you have tens of different devices in your premise, the cost difference of the MF, MFI, MFI chip is very significant because every single device, if it is combined to Apple uh, HomeKit RF technology, which is BLE or Wi-Fi, you need, to, you need to have a MFI chip. And in our configuration, we only need to have one MFI chip in the hub. And the device, it doesn't need to have 
MFI chip, and with the set wave technology, it permits much longer communication range because it's no longer in the congested 2.4 mega uh, gigahertz. And you have a very big variety of choices for products. But uh, for on the end user perspective, there's no difference for their user experience. iOS still consider those set wave technology in the network uh, HomeKit products. Here's some market forecast for about smart home and, and the IOTs. I don't want to elaborate because after all, they all forecast. And they are all very optimistic. And, but one thing I can certain is the growth will be very big due to many reasons. But perhaps for all of you guys, you might be more concerned about if this wave is going to come, where is your opportunity, right? And is there any low hanging fruits we can grab? So this is something I want to share with you guys. Number one, basically uh, from all the analytics of the market and the forecast predicted US will be the leading market for home automation. And second is in Europe, and third will be Asia. But Asia has so many different countries and they have different income levels and different regulations. So it tends to be com complicated. So my suggestion is focus on US and Europe. This is a market survey by iControl, one of the tier one smart home technology provider. And I'm not going to dig into the numbers because they basically forecast. Yes. Uh, so I want to show something real and significant for you guys, which is a survey uh, market analytics by strategy analytics for the US market survey report by the end of 2016. And there are around 2.4 million of homes they subscribed so-called smart home as service, which means they're paying the operator every month to, for using the smart home technology. And in this table, you can see, basically, they are smart home, sorry, they are telco or service provider of the securities. And among of these top 10, half of them, which is five, adopt set wave technology. And the top three, they are all deployed with set wave technology. So as a result, C-Wave account more than 70% of the market share in, in, the top, in the top 10. And how big is the entire US market at this moment? By end of 2016, it was 3 million subscribers subscribing for smart home service. Compared to 142 million households in United States, this is a very, very I would say perfectly small number, which means there will be a huge potential for the growth. And I think every year doubling the number is not very difficult because we already reached to a tipping point today, at least for the US market. Who use set wave technology? Telcos. So, uh, security service provider, they are the biggest deployer. And for the brands, there are some tier one brands, they adopted set wave technology. Actually, 
they mainly supplying those telco and service providers. And also energy conservation program in Europe are also using set wave, but not significant to, to the rest of the market. And nowadays we have 450 members in our alliance and we have more than 1,700 certified products going to have 18 certified products. So I, one of the major merit of a com fully compliant technology is, is a level playground, no matter you're a big guy or small guy. You don't need to have a total solution to tap into this market. You can <laughs> have only one switch, one sensor, you can tap into the market. I think this is a very exciting opportunity for us in the foreseeable future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, CK. Uh, thank you the in inspiration words from Lawrence, Aaron, and CK. We have about 10 minutes to take the questions from the audience. Please raise your hand if you have a question. Please say your name and organization. So there are three questions from both Terence and I. So the first question that I'm going to raise is to Lawrence. So Lawrence, how the IOV will fundamentally change the driving style of a driver in future? Well, maybe in the future, if you are the owner of an uh, autonomous vehicle, uh, maybe the f in the past you you find that you are a very good driver, but in the future you have no chance to demonstrate your uh, driving style because in the future there are no more style because everything is controlled by the computer. But of course, the good stuff is uh, we do believe in terms of safety and also the fuel economy should be greatly in improved and increased. That is uh, also because of the. Uh, uh, due to the benefits of the big data analysis, it helps you to identify and then to select the, uh, the optimized configuration of, the, of your vehicle. Uh, thank you, Lawrence. So the same question will raise, raise up by to uh, Terence. Thank you. So I have a question for Alan. So actually two weeks ago, we have a global security issue about WannaCry. Okay, so from a security perspective. So how do you think um, IoT can avoid such cyber security issue in the coming future? And what could we do better? Okay, I think, I think this, uh, I, would, I want to make it uh, clear first, actually. A lot of people asking us, what is Concord, uh, the so-called so uh, 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 business category? You see, we are neither cyber, we are neither man guarding. Actually, we created a new business category called intelligent guarding. Obviously, I think with the way we uh, integrate and we using this IoT to connect many buildings, that will definitely uh, one day help us to put in a position to defense things such as cybercrime, I suppose. And uh, I think that's, that's the answer, yeah. So at this present moment, I don't think we are at that stage yet, yeah. All right, that's, that's good, thank you. And one more question for CK. So just now you have shared with us about the advantage and disadvantage about C-Wave. And actually how can we apply this in the like home appliance for Hong Kong like SME? Can we do a little bit more? Actually I didn't elaborate about the dis disadvantage of said way, but it does have. Um, uh, I would say Hong Kong is pretty a pretty special market because our environment is very dense and our houses are very small. Yeah. And, uh, and Hong Kong also impose a very different RF regulation than the rest of the world. So if any company they want to enter in the Hong Kong market, they got to almost they have to have their own total solution because they don't find any of the cell product, even is set wave from other from any so resources sources because uh, the market is too small for them. So 
my suggestion for anyone who want to embark with set weight technology, they should look into US market, the European market, right. which I call them the low hanging fruits. Right. They will really have a sizable demand out there. Right, thank you. Uh, before asking the audiences, and uh, Lawrence would like to supplement a little bit more about the driver's style. Yes. <laughs> now, of course, uh, uh, in addition to driver's style, I just want to emphasize one more point is, now, in terms of IOV, now, uh, it's no longer focused on mechanical, electrical, or automotive engineering. IOV is a new stuff. We base on computer science, big data, data analytics, cloud server. Now, all these kind of new technology are, well, more or less the same as the, um, uh, say, the, the, the mobile phone or even the modem application. Now, in the past, maybe the apps developer, the, sof the software uh, development company, they have no idea and they do not expect that they can jump into the supply chain of, of the automotive industry. But right now, in the future, there's a big chance for them, okay? Because that will be the very, very big financial benefit in front of them. Um, all the OEM car makers, I mean, even just like Mercedes-Benz, BMW, all those giants companies, just or even just like the uh, Tesla, you know, the, the the founder of the Tesla, where it's from, it's from the IT industry, right? So, uh, in Science Park, we understand that there are so many startups company right here. They focus on the development of software, uh, or high tech, or IT uh, related communication technology. Well, so that will be the big business for them. That will be the big change in terms of the business environment and also the business opportunity for the in, uh, in the IOV um, platform. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lawrence. Now comes the time of uh, for questions to be raised up by the audiences. So, any question? Ah, Stan, ah, Miss Stanley, please. Ah, uh, thank you, Dorothy Stanley, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. My question is for Dr. Lawrence. A uh, very interesting presentation, and uh, you talked about the. Uh, my question is about the data, and we talk about big data for vehicular. Uh, applications and uh, internet in vehicles. And hearing your presentation and the Amazon uh, cloud services right before that made me ask, uh, think about, okay, well, who is going to own this data? You know, all this data that's coming from the cars, where does it go? Do I, as a vehicle owner, uh, have the option to contribute that to a cloud somewhere, that then it, it could be part of the data store that's accessed by something like the London application? Or is this uh, data going to the vehicle manufacturer or to the, um, the jurisdiction in which I'm driving? If you could comment on that, thank you. Um, thanks for your question, Chris. Now, uh, this is a big question with one single key word, privacy. Um, of course, even from the government's point of view, they want to collect all those uh, necessary information, the data, the GPS, the location of the vehicles on the highway so that they can um, do the necessary analysis uh, for the uh, uh, law enforcement, uh, due to the law enforcement requirement and also for the maintenance, uh, fuel economy control, blah, 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 blah. It all depends whether if you are the car owner whether you're willing to disclose uh, your information is a kind of a privacy. So um, from the government's point of view, or even just like our, uh, just like the government agents, right, uh, our political council, we are working very closely together with the uh, SME in the industry. Uh, we try to launch some new program uh, and then to build it with some, what should I say, the, the benefit or free services uh, to convince or to attract the car owner, uh, uh, try to let them, well, at least try to convince them uh, the willing to 
uh, to vote in or to opt in this kind of services first. That's, that's very important. Just like nowadays, uh, everyone of us are using either iOS or Android-based mobile phone. I'm pretty sure uh, whenever you download the application, you've already clicked yes, 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 right? But have you checked carefully whether you yes for something, <laughs> right? Of course, it's, it's all about the privacy issue. Now, uh, assuming that, I'm pretty sure uh, because if you want to enjoy some benefit, uh, maybe uh, up to a certain extent you allowed uh, the, the service provider to capture your limited uh, data. Okay, then after that, um, again from, from the government point of view, uh, if they can collect all those data, uh, they can achieve many things, many things. Okay, not only the safety, uh, a security issue, but the very important thing is even the traffic congestion. Traffic congestion problem. In the recent few weeks in Hong Kong, we have a lot of debate uh, regarding, say, oh, any other solutions that can, we can solve the traffic congestion in Hong Kong, even in Beijing, in Guangzhou. Uh, that's why in different provinces in mainland China, they're also doing the similar thing. I am the solution provider and all the answers. Now, when you go into a car, what they call the telematics, okay? Telematics. So the, the whatever you do in the telematics, you have a what they call a black box. Now, how do you collect data? Now, the black box, the CPU, must connect to what they call the canvas. The canvas got all the data from the car, the engine, blah, blah, blah. And secondly, where you're going, your speed, where you are, is collected through the GPS. Now the trouble is, you only, the car only know what it's doing, right? So that you have to feed back all the data publicly through a network to a service provider. And who are those networks? The mobile operators. So in China, when you install what they call the telemetrics in the car, when you buy the car, when they install it, so you say, okay, I'm going to get a service from the internet. So automatically, you, you connect it to Channel Mobile, and they will collect all your data. You understand what I mean? So whoever is the internet provider plus the mobile operator, they got all the data on your car, on your engine, and also on where you've been going. You understand what I mean? Now, then the difficult issue is that how the government will work with the telcos on this data. Same in the US because there's only limited number of operators in the world. So that is what they call the mobile, what's called territorial, territorial mobile. But when you go further, then you have satellite. That means in future, the telemetric will have two feedback loop. One is through the mobile, GSM, 4G or 5G. The other one is that when those are out of service, then you use the satellite. Then the satellite again will go through a limited number of service providers. So that answers the question. That's where the data is. Now how they store it, how they use it, is a different matter. Now you know, okay? Uh, thank you, Professor Chen, and also thank you for a question from uh, Ms. Stanley, uh, actually it's Dr. Stanley. So, uh, just, just one more question over there. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, George from SME, uh, Great China SME. Uh, having heard all the speakers uh, mention, uh, it seems to me that the privacy and then the standardization is very important. For example, when you mentioned about the em emergency call, all the cars from Europe you know, has to have that device there. How about, you know, you guys haven't talked about China. Uh, recently, I read the article uh, by uh, Baidu. You know, Mr. Lee said that, uh, you know, talk about this autonomous vehicle. He said, uh, you know, it's sort of like controlled by, you know, whether it's from the, uh, the Waymo, from uh, Google, uh, Alphabet, or the Tesla, or Uber, whatever. It's all, you know, uh, US or European companies. But now, uh, they said, oh, oh, Baidu has to do something because the market is really in China. If I do not open my, you know, so what are, we, what are we saying is that I'm going to give my technology free to everybody to create the whole ecosystem. 
you know, what you guys are doing, even set wave, you know. I mean, I think if, if everybody's using a set wave, you're controlling the market. You know, the open, you know, you, you, know, you see, you talk about the US market. And the same thing, China is going to have their own system, own standard. You know, now China is leading 5G. China has this Bei, Beidou. They don't, they don't care about the Galileo whatever system. They're going to say, I'm going to have my own system. I'm going to have own, own device. I'm going to do this. If you're going to come in the market, you better comply with my system. That's all I'm seeing right now. So uh, I don't know, because all the speakers you touch on haven't touched on this big market called China. And what are you going to do about it? You know, most of the technology is from US, from Europe, and others. So I'm just thinking, you know, like being in Hong Kong, you, know, you said the RFC is very unique. I'm sure that China is very controlled, like what uh, Dr. Chen said, you know. Somehow, you know, how are you going to have this protocol between, you know, the rest of the world and China? So this, this is my uh, little comment. Maybe you want to comment on that. Okay, uh, let me try to... Um, uh, feedback to your to, to your to your concern or question first. Now, of course, uh, every one of us concerned about privacy issue. But let me tell you, uh, unless you're not using mobile phone or other rights, you have no way to safeguard your privacy. To be honest, to be honest, you've already lost it. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, now the good stuff is because uh, the the, the telco uh, network and also the mobile uh, service providers, they've already set up quite a good infrastructure in terms of privacy. So uh, when uh, in the future, if we uh, uh, further deploy the technology of IOV and IOT, we can simply benchmark the similar um, terms and condition for the uh, privacy issue, to, to protect the privacy issue. But I want to emphasize right here, it's not only the privacy issue. Now, for the mobile phone, it doesn't matter. Uh, in some certain extent, the worst scenario is you lost the privacy uh, issue. However, for the automotive, for the vehicle, it's, a, it's about safety. You may imagine, what if uh, one acquired virus um, hack uh, the, the, uh, the ECU or the, the electronic control unit on, on board, on your vehicle? The virus can control your vehicle and then to, to cause the traffic accident. That is even more important than the privacy issue. Uh, in fact, uh, in, in just uh, uh, April, uh, there was a, uh, uh, a world-class, worldwide uh, international conference. This is the SAE um, a conference. It's an annual uh, event. Uh, a lot of debate, a lot of uh, presentations. We talk about cybersecurity uh, in order to upkeep the level or increase the level for the uh, safety issue, not only the privacy. So uh, the answer is, uh, in terms of privacy, I, I do believe uh, in terms of privacy level will be more or less the same in the future because uh, uh, if you're using the mobile phone, I don't think if you, uh, if you equip the similar devices on your, uh, auto, uh, uh, on, on your vehicle or even uh, in your smart home will make the case even worse? I, I, I don't think so, but uh, in terms of the safety issue, we need to think about it. Okay. Uh, is there any question? Uh, Aaron, is there? Oh, okay. Hand me. deployment? <laughs> That's a difficult question. I, I think it's quite hard to um, judge in terms of that because uh, I mean each country develops its own uh, so-called uh, technology. So I think that question, I do not think I want to so-called answer. Yeah, do not want to comment. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is there any last question? Alan, if you collect all the information of the security information for the whole country, what is the value of that information to every commercial government body? De definitely, I think this uh, will put us in a position that earlier this morning, somebody was saying that Amazon can rule the country. 
So in one of these days, we collect all this data. I mean, it put us in a good position, but obviously we're not going to do that because, I mean, I don't think we can reach until that stage. Am I under your question? Uh, thank you all for your valuable time. I'm sure that the insights and sharing given by you all have inspired all the audiences. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.